hungry. Globally, 821 million people are hungry. That's one in nine people on this planet. And here in the United States, nearly 40 million people experience hunger every single year, including more than 11 million children. They go to bed hungry every night. Hunger remains one of humanity's greatest challenges. The number of people without enough to eat is rising. In 2020, more than 750 million people went hungry, maybe as many as 811 million, around a, a tenth of the global population. CBS 46 investigates a growing problem that's becoming harder and harder to ignore. On any given night, hundreds of people are sleeping on the streets of Atlanta. On any given night, hundreds of people are sleeping on the streets of Atlanta. On the streets, streets of Atlanta, of Atlanta. More than 10,000 people experiencing homelessness in our state every day. A big need Clancy says her teams don't expect to see ending anytime soon. They're not doing any of that. They're just putting you in a place, you know, because they get paid for it. And some people can do it and some can't. We need to have the food that we'll be able to deliver in food boxes to families who may have lost jobs over the last week or two or had their hours cut so significantly that they'll be struggling to, you know, to put food on the table and pay rent. It's amazing that new birth is more than just Sunday morning. We're every day. And in this month of unusual focus, in a year of business as unusual, we are now doing unusual community service. You've heard about the King's Table and what we do on the road to feeding one million people. But this unusual lawn giveaway on the first Saturday of every month is what we're really all about. Our senior pastor, Dr. Jamal Harrison Bryant, is not just giving the word through ministry, he's giving the word through community service. And what we've been able to do is not just allow food insecurities to no longer be an excuse. We've allowed technology to be our opportunity. We're making sure that Wi-Fi, that phone service, and every device needed for us to progress and be successful in our communities to be delivered to everybody we impact free of charge. We are New Birth not just because of what we do on Sunday. We are New Birth because of what we do seven days a week. It's a year of business as unusual, a month of unusual focus. But what is usual is we're always giving back to people as God has given to us. We are new birth. And we love you. I'm Pastor Carla Stokes, and I'm the pastor of ministries and outreach here at New Birth. The King's Table had a wonderful beginning. It all started when this wonderful lady, Mrs. Flossie Varner, came to me and said, I have an idea. Can I run something by you? And I said, sure. And she told me that she thought we needed to have a food ministry. She told me about the food pantry that was at New Birth when the church was on Snap Finger Road. So many years ago, there was a food ministry, but when the church moved from Snapfinger Road over to Woodrow Road, the ministry just didn't come over with the church. So there was no food pantry. Well, actually, there was a food closet. There's a closet in the church that the member care department kept. And if ever there was a family that needed something to eat, 
they would go into that closet and just pull out some canned goods or crackers, just things that they had purchased to put in that closet. Uh, but it wasn't a big operation. It was just on an as needed basis. And of course, if somebody needed something and they were really in an emergency situation, the church has always met the need. And so uh, however we could meet it, we would try to meet that need, but nothing on a large scale. So, you know, we took that idea to Dr. Bryant and our senior pastor loved the idea. And he said, yes, we could go forward. That's how the ministry started really good in cooking and just thank God that I'm able to do it. And you just want to see others enjoy the food. So it's just a place of comfort, a place of peace where you can slow down at the end of the day and enjoy each other's company. So that's what it is to me. Today I have the pleasure of opening up another box from the King's Table Food Bank at New Birth Missionary Baptist Church. We have collard greens. Typically this box will feed a family of four for one week. During the pandemic, my son wasn't working, my daughter-in-law wasn't working, and with four grandkids there, I had to make sure they had something to eat. And then from there, it extended to my neighborhood. Hi, ladies. I was able to provide boxes for some of my neighbors to take them to them to share. I also was able to share with my home church, which is 60 miles away, to take food back to their local community. But you just don't realize that that many people are in need. And I think the people that come are truly in need because who would get up early on Saturday morning get in that line and stay if you didn't need the food. An old lady in our church called me uh, one day after service and said, I want to open a food pantry. I was absolutely against the idea because in my head it was just some closet full of canned foods of fruit cocktail <laughs> and lima beans that was going nowhere. Uh, but she was so insistent, so adamant that we opened it. Uh, when we first started, we were averaging 300 families a month. It went to 300 a week, to 500 a week, to 1,000 a week, to 3,000 a week, to 4,000. Uh, and I was absolutely amazed. Churches are coming from Chattanooga, Tennessee, from Savannah, Georgia, from Aiken, South Carolina, uh, which says this is not a local issue, but it is a national one. It is uh, not just consumption, it is community. My grandkids can always come over and eat. I mean, to be able to share with them what I have, it's a blessing. It's a blessing. I'm so grateful for that day that Mrs. Flossie Varner brought that idea that we needed to have a food pantry at New Birth. It was her inspiration that got this all started. She brought the idea, Pastor Bryant signed off on it, and then she came back with Miss Jerry Perrin, and together we just sat down with our small team and put our heads together to figure out how to get it off the ground. But then God sent us a ram in the bush, and he sent Miss Carrie Pabone to be our manager. My name is Carrie Pabone, director of the King's Table Food Ministry. I have had the joy and the honor and the privilege of serving for almost 24 months with this great ministry here at New Birth Missionary Baptist Church. She came for another reason for a meeting to talk about another project. I remember the day when I went into Pastor Collar Stokes' office for a meeting. I wanted a meeting about sex trafficking, a project that I had in mind to start up a program here at the church. And um, before I left the meeting, um, we had a wonderful conversation and I asked her an open-ended question. What do you need? And I was able to talk about this idea for the food pantry because the ladies had just left. And of course she mentioned like the king's table, the illumination of God just glowed upon her uh, with excitement. And she told me about the king's table and the needs. So at that time, I was like, okay, what do you need? She said everything. She was the person who God sent because she had volunteered at a food pantry and, and knew about the operations. 
With her expertise, we've been able to grow this food pantry from serving 30 families to thousands of families. And we're on the road to 1 million families. It is amazing. I cannot wait for that moment when we say that we have served our 1 millionth person at the King's table. It was, we had connections with Borden's, you know, the dairy plants. We got the, the farmer's bar boxes with fresh produce in them. So we were able to bless um, beyond our community. Uh, we had started to establish partners because the local churches would come to us and say, how do we be a part of what you're doing? And uh, sure enough, we, we came together and started forming partners. Um, not only churches, it was different organizations from um, DeKalb County juvenile court system, um, orphanage organizations, um, you name it. People from all over just wanted to be a part of the work that we were doing here at New Birth. I'm Bo Barber II, and I am the senior pastor of Prospect AMU Church um, in North Columbus, Forts in Georgia. Part of the challenge of being a ministry in the 21st century is meeting people where they are and also having the resources to support those ministries. We found that the more we engage with black and brown communities and the underserved communities in our area and try to partner with agencies that were well established, whether they are government or local or whatever, the requirement to share information about the people that we engage with was overwhelming. One of the things that really shocked me was one day I, I went in and uh, I got a phone call from my bus driver and he said that I just went to uh, one of the sites and to pick up some seniors and they have not come out yet. So I called the management office and while calling her and talking to her, she said to me, what are y'all doing today? Because the seniors, they really do love that program. And I said, we're going to the movies. And she said, how much is the movies? And I told her that it was $4. And she said, oh, that's why they're not out there. She said, they don't have $4. She said, most of them, they only have $17 after they pay their rent. And she said, they're not going to come out because they're embarrassed. And so that was the reason why they weren't coming out. And um, I was just shocked to know that she told me they live off the boxes that we were supplying to those seniors. The distance between the ministry at King's Table and Columbus, Georgia was almost 100 miles. Carrie found a way to get um, trucks to us. We receive a truck every month, um, anywhere from, from 200 to 400 boxes of food and also the non-essential items, which brings us into another space of helping people to understand just because we are in need, that does not mean that we are without worth and that we should somehow suffer um, not being able to have some of the amenities of life um, to make life worth living. Since we've been, uh, the COVID came and we had the pandemic, we had to uh, close down, actually shut down completely. And when we shut down, I still had the needs for the seniors to be fed. So um, the King's Table was able to supply those needs. I was able to get them fresh fruits and vegetables that they didn't have before because the other boxes that I was giving to them prior to the pandemic was non-perishable foods. And this was something that was better for them, healthier for them. And um, along with the fresh fruits and vegetables, we were able to give them the essential items or beauty care items that um, encouraged them to go on Zoom because Zoom was something new to them. They had not been exposed to that type of technology. So in the broader sense, King's Table has given, given us the opportunity in our ministry to, to grow and to expand like, I'm, like I said, being a, being a church family of about 200 people, you have to spend your resources in a smart way. That means people, that means money, that means material, that means everything. And when we are able to partner with ministries like King Table, King's Table, it, it, it's, it's life changing, not only for the ministry, but for the people we serve. What we do, um, we deliver 50 boxes every other week. So that's twice a month, which is a total of 100 boxes that we deliver to the seniors, to their private homes and apartments. 
We, uh, we serve apartments all over the city of Atlanta where we um, supply the needs to seniors. We even go as far as Hampton, Georgia to deliver these boxes to the senior citizens. And these uh, fresh fruits and vegetables is, is needed um, with the health issues that many of them have, this gives them an opportunity to have fresh fruits and vegetables when many of them that live in high rises, live in food deserts, that they don't have the access to transportation or access to actually uh, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables that are available to them in the stores near their homes. In Columbus, Georgia, this is the third largest city in, in Georgia, but we are far away from most distribution situations. I was on a Zoom call um, with a group of people through Bishop Jackson, Reginald T. Jackson, the Bishop of the AME Church here in Georgia. And one of the presenters was Sister Carrie. Carrie gave us all the reasons why we should be a part of the community of King's Table. And by finding that, we found a new resource. It was fantastic because not only did it, did it supply us the need that we had for resources of food, both perishable and non-perishable, but it also gave us the opportunity to sh sh showboat or to highlight black and brown people helping black and brown people. Um, the position of Prospect AME Church is, it was once a rural church, now a suburban church surrounded by a demographic that does not look like us, uh, physically nor socioeconomically. And in order for, I believe, people to have a sense of belonging, they need to see people who look like them helping them. And at that time, we had like 30 people coming in on a weekly basis on a Tuesday. Uh, that was the second week of February. Shortly after that, we know COVID hit, COVID hit, COVID hit, COVID hit. COVID hit. Now to growing concerns about the deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. The breaking news, stay at home. That is the order tonight from four state governors as the coronavirus pandemic spreads. But just over a million jobs, 1.01 million jobs were lost for the month of March. This is 10 times the record amount, uh, 10 times the worst amount that we saw during the recession back in 2008, 2009. Uh, we also are seeing the... The impact is absolutely unfathomable. Uh, when you think about how many uh, people are living in food insecurity, one out of seven children don't know where their next meal is coming from. Deal with the countless thousands who have been furloughed, those who are now living out of their savings. Uh, it's an amazing impact, not just financially, uh, but psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. 50% of Americans say that somebody in their household either has lost a job or if they're hourly has had significant cutbacks in the number of hours. So, so we anticipate that the unemployment rate, when it'll be announced next week in the, in the jobs report, we had talked about the last couple of weeks, it being in the 12, 13% range, it might actually cross 15%. We proclaimed in churches all over the country that 2020 was the year of clear vision. Uh, and hopefully we are able to see in a much clearer way uh, than we have had in the past. We're seeing what's important. We're seeing what we can live without. We're seeing what is valuable uh, and we're seeing what is necessary. What do you tell those who come to you to not succumb to the anxiety, to the stress and how to be positive during this? Uh, is to realize that uh, in the words of Maya Angelou, every cloud runs out of rain, uh, that this is really temporary, that this is going to be survivable, uh, is that uh, our grandparents had to sacrifice by fighting in a war, and now we have to sacrifice simply by sitting on a couch. Uh, and so when you look at it in comparison, I think that this is doable and achievable, and we've got so many examples from Psalms that says weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in the morning. And I, I think that this is the greatest hour for the church to reintroduce itself mm -hmm. to a large demographic that has sworn off church. Mm -hmm. Declared that they were never going to step back in the building. Well, now you don't have to. Uh, right. You can uh, turn on your <laughs> laptop or your phone. Uh, we're seeing record breaker numbers of viewership. And now the next frontier it's going to be discipleship uh, because if all it is that we're doing is just streaming but not transforming, 
uh, then we're just uh, a sanctified version of Netflix and not really doing kingdom building. I, I think this is a harboring a word that this generation has lost, which is community. Uh, that we're going back to understanding who is my neighbor, uh, that all of us are connected, all of us have a bond, and all of us have a responsibility to look out for one another. Our seniors, uh, our children, the disenfranchised. The reality is the coronavirus doesn't care about your ethnicity, your age, uh, or your preferences, whether you're Democrat or Republican, all of us are tied to the same fabric of humanity. The pandemic really hit me differently as a, as a single person with no children, um, being confined to my house and not being able to see people, it, it was different. Um, so I loved going out on Saturday mornings and being able to see people, um, but I wasn't sleeping very well. I mean, most nights I didn't sleep at all. If I did, I may have slept for an hour or two and was in therapy and everything. Took pills for anxiety, for depression. Um, it was just, the pandemic just really hit me differently. And, social injustice and racism and all the killings, it just really put me in a low space. Um, and so this one day, I was so tired. I was on the plane coming back from uh, Milwaukee to Atlanta. And I was just tired because I knew I hadn't slept and I had stopped taking the pills that would help me go to sleep. And I was sitting on that plane. I was just like, I really need to get some sleep. And the thought that I had in my mind was, I should just take this whole bottle of pills. If I take this whole bottle of pills, then I can get some sleep. I can sleep forever if I just take this whole bottle of pills. And literally, as I was flying back, I was flying back so that I could serve at the King's table. It was a Friday night and I was flying back so that I could serve at the King's table. And I said to myself, if I take these pills and I go to sleep, then I won't be able to serve at the King's table. And it was that thought that crossed my mind in that moment that said, I have a reason to live. King's Table gave me a reason to live and it was the reason that I did not take the bottle of pills. I didn't take one pill. When I got back home, I threw the pills down the toilet and I said, I'm never taking those pills again to sleep because if I never sleep another day, at least I have something that gives me purpose. At least I know where I'm going on Saturday mornings and I know what I'm doing. And so I'm so eternally grateful for God allowing me to meet Carrie Pavone, to meet Pastor Carlos Stokes, to be able to serve his people at the King's table. And I will continue to serve until I don't have another breath in my body. We were facing challenges with storage, not having enough food, um, potentially having to feed far more than our 30 faithful 30 people every week. It went quickly from that number to thousands in one week. And so the numbers jumped very drastically, um, very fast, and we had to have a game plan for that. And so with that, we now, are at the point of serving over 900,000 people. 
which we have been able to do since January of 2020, which is absolutely amazing. And I remember at that time, the government declared um, no one but essential workers need to be out. So we were essential, people needed food. But what made us different, we offered something much more essential than food. And that was prayer coupled with that. So we offer food and prayer and just to see the, the, the excitement on the people's faces that the Lord has sent an answer. We, can, we have food to feed our families. And we saw everything from, you know, Bentleys coming through the lines, uh, Mercedes, BMWs, you name it. it. This pandemic has hit everybody across the board. So it affected all of us. So we were able to meet the needs of the people through the King's Table Food Ministry. I'm Deacon Tommy Penn from Berean Christian Church. I attend Berean Christian Church. And I was coming to Newburgh to get food for different ones in line. And I would stay in line sometimes two hours to get the food. So one of Newburgh members told me at the end of the line that I should be a partner with them, then I could get more boxes to distribute them out. So I became a member of the, uh, the of getting the king table. And at that time, I started uh, signing up and then I started to doing what uh, she was telling me to do concerning getting the boxes. And once I started getting the boxes, I had some three different people to take and uh, distribute them out, help me distribute them out. One of them was from Jamaica and she started shipping them to Jamaica. And it's been a blessing for the people there in Jamaica to receive those boxes of food, non-parish good that would be in them. And it's been a blessing to be able to distribute the boxes out to different peoples, peoples that don't have food and when they get those boxes it just be a joy and I think this church and Dr. Jamal for being able to do what they are doing for the community with the food boxes and different things. My name is Dr. Mariam Ogundeko, the founder of our channel Legacy Foundation based off of uh, here it registered in Atlanta and also in Nigeria. I first came in contact with the King's Table through um, Carrie, Miss Carrie Pabon. We got talking about what they do at the King's Table. And um, she told me about how we could partner with them to serve the community with food stuffs and items, household items for the, you know, the less privileged or the people that really need them. And um, Immediately, I saw the need because of my people in Nigeria. COVID hit Nigeria bad. A lot of people were, you know, out of their jobs. A lot of women, widows, and children were displaced. And I, as the founder of Chenna Legacy Foundation, saw the need for my people through the King's Table. Um, we at Achena Legacy Foundation have been fortunate enough to receive two container loads, two 40 foot container loads of consumables to my people in Nigeria. They're such a blessing. The King's Table is a blessing. Hi, my name is Ida Smith. I'm a member of the Greater Solid Rock Baptist Church, Riverdale, Georgia, under the leadership of Reverend Dr. Anton Rowe. Um, I am so very, or we are very appreciative of the King's Table um, Food Ministry and um, assisting us in providing healthy, nutritious uh, food items to members of our uh, community. I actually um, became aware of the King's Table uh, Food Ministry through one of your um, elders, Elder um, Craig Heath. Uh, when I was sharing with him the initiatives that we were doing at our church and some of the challenges faced by other food banks um, in which we don't have the structure 
to store nor we don't have the storage nor the refrigeration for some of the food items so we were denied um, by one of the local food banks and he was sharing with us about the food items and the opportunities that you guys provided and he gave me the contact information um, to your uh, food ministry coordinator and so that's when Carrie and I um, began our partnership November 2020. So we did a survey and we asked all of our partners what has the King's Table done for your community? Um, would you like to continue this program? Um, you know, just to get a feel of the temperature of what their thoughts were. And all of them said the same thing. How are we going to do it? How are we going to keep our people fed? And I said, okay, this is it. Not only do the um, King's Table food ministry provide food items. There are a lot of um, other household, small appliances, refrigerators. Um, we've received personal care items. Um, and when members come through the line and see these items stored in front of the food boxes, you know, their first uh, question is, are those items, the refrigerators, uh, available? Are they free? And yes, we have provided those items and the air fryer, some of the things that you wouldn't think of um, that you would get in a food distribution line that we, you guys are providing those items so that we're able to bless others in the communities with um, refrigeration for those who don't have a refrigerator or um, uh, air fryers. Uh, we've gotten so many small uh, um, small household appliances through you guys. Hi, my name is Julia Sims. I'm a member here at Newburgh for 16 and a half years. I'm, I'm one of the volunteers at Newburgh at the King's Table. And doing my volunteer, Carrie came and chose me as being one of the leaders. And during that time, I have grown so much. It has taught me how to lead. It has taught me how to serve. It has taught me how to dedicate people to do things that um, I normally wouldn't know how to do. And during this time of serving so many people, I've, I went through a dark moment myself to where I um, was without no one to stay. But that didn't stop me because I realized that this is my heart. My heart is serving. I love to serve. I love giving back. I love you know, making a difference in people's life. I love always putting people before myself. And I just wanna thank God for caring, for seeing something in me that I did not see in myself. And being a part of this King Table, we have fed over 800,000 people. And I've been here since day one. I have seen people come through the line that was so grateful, telling their stories, how much they thank God for Pastor Jamal Bryan and his vision that Newburgh have as far as giving back to the community. I have seen people crying, saying, no, thank you. We have been here through the storm, through the rain, through the snow, through four seasons, but we never stop. You know, there's time like, why are y'all out here serving? This is what we love, this is what we do. And I'm just grateful to be a part of this movement, I say, I call it a movement because of we haven't stopped. You know, this right here is ministry. I know people get caught up in the four walls, but this right here to me is true ministry. It told me, it has shown me what ministry is truly is and ministry is serving. And God said, if you love my people, if you love me, you will serve my people. And I thank God for being a part of this King table. And I just pray that, you know, we continue to do God's will and we continue to um, make a difference in the lives of people because people are being blessed. We're not only just doing people in the community, but I did not realize that we are feeding people in so many different countries. You know, we have gave back to different, uh, when crisis came up, we have gave back to different um, countries and everything and different communities. And I just thought we were just doing the people around here, but we have blessed thousands and thousands of people. And just to come back to know that we making a difference and me being a part of 
that, you know, movement, I'm grateful. I remember, um, I think it was around March, uh, we had an encounter with, um, we had an encounter with uh, a partner that wanted to link up with us. That partner was through World Vision. Now just, let me back up a little. Just before we partnered with World Vision, you know, it was like, Lord, I mean, I remember sleepless nights, Lord, show me, talk to me, Holy Spirit, and show me how are we gonna continue our inventory? Um, we were going from grocery store to grocery store wiping out shelves and loading up our cars, you know, trying to make sure that we had enough inventory in stock. And I remember I, I made one phone call out of the state of Florida to this guy. I heard he was, he had the connections to get food trucks. And when I finally had that conversation with him, he said one statement that made a whole difference to me. He said, why buy the food when you can get it for free? I said, hmm. And he told me the operation he had. He said, you need to tap into the, what the farmers and the dairy plants, um, the program that, you know, we're saving all of these dairy plants and farmers. I said, well, what is it? He said, it's called the Farms to Families program. It's been initiated by the government. I was like, okay. So shortly after that conversation, I was waiting for him to, you know, put together the truck schedule for me and everything. And I never heard anything else from him. But I remember that one statement. He say, why buy the food when you can have it for free? And that thing stuck with me. And I never forget, I had a dream and I, and I shared this with our team. I say, I hear it loud and clear in my sleep. The trucks are coming, the trucks are coming, the trucks are coming. It's like a boom, a thunder. The trucks are coming, the trucks are coming. And sure enough, shortly after that, maybe not even a week later, World Vision came into play. So this is at the beginning of the pandemic. I actually was in the hospital with COVID. I contracted COVID uh, the week before the shutdown, but I was confirmed with having COVID around March 13th, 2020. I suffered with COVID from March 13th, 2020 until July the 3rd of 2020, roughly about 120 days. I had two lung surgeries. They found tumors in my lungs, two lung collapses, but I'm here to testify that God is good and he is a healer. I remember that the, that the King's table had already been doing boxes, but this is even before the pandemic started. And I believe the peak was maybe 300 boxes a week. And I remember calling and saying, hey, I think there's an opportunity here since you guys have already been good stewards over what you've been doing for us to partner with you guys to bring in more food to our community. They had the connections, the direct connections with the Farms to Family program. So God again answered our prayers and the trucks truly did come. <laughs> they came by the by uh, semi-trucks every single week. Um, we were getting up to 10,000 boxes of food a week. That's right, a week. So the trucks truly came it was, we had connections with Borden's, you know, the dairy plants. We got the, the farmer's bar boxes with fresh produce in them. So we were able to bless um, beyond our community. This is our 13th week, and for 13 weeks, we've been feeding 1,000 families. This is y'all shout. Talking and Pastor Bryant, he was 
was concerned like, hey, we're gonna go from 300 to, basically we started off with 2000. And then once we did that, then the started rolling it was more and more and more and more and more until it got to be about eight to 10,000 boxes per week. How does a local church make a global impact? Oh, oh. You connect with world religion. What it is that God has called us to do has been maximized to the highest degree because of their capacity. I'm grateful and I'm excited. For the last 12 weeks of the pandemic, we've been able to feed 1,000 families a week. But now that we're walking alongside World Vision, that number has exponentially grown to 8,000 a week. It is no secret what God can do. Jesus said, greater things than these will you do. He fed 5,000, and today, because of World Vision, we're able to feed 8,000. The best is yet to come. Information is power, and he who controls information controls the world. We are now in um, a position to be able to provide broadband capabilities to the surrounding communities around our church. Hopefully in the next year, we will be able to link in just like you would to any major communication um, network. Kerry brought to our attention the, uh, the availability of of hardware, um, tablets, and so forth. We were able to participate in that program in addition to the food, in addition to the non-essentials. And it is going to be a watershed moment when we are able to continue to connect all of these people um, with the resources from King Table, King's Table. God bless you and um, Dr. Bryan and all of the work that's happening here because his, his tentacles are reaching far beyond the perimeter of Atlanta. So I remember one of our lead volunteers, um, his wife had pulled up to pick him up for the day. And I said, thank you so much for loaning us your husband. He is such a blessing to us. She said, hold on, Miss Carrie, let me share something with you. She said, no, let me thank you. And she began to unfold a story on how, you know, when the pandemic hit, they were a two household income. And she said, uh, he was laid off and it was it dropped down to one income. She said, but the time that he spent up there volunteering with you guys, she said, that has been the biggest blessing for our household. She said, you made our household better. She said, my husband never felt a part of anything within the ministry. She said, I was the one that was always, you know, being a busy bee here, a busy bee there. And I used to feel bad for him because he wasn't involved like I was involved. But he would just encourage me and say, honey, you go ahead. But when you asked him to, when he started coming to the king's table and you started giving him different little assignments, she said, he would come home a different person. She said, it gave him a sense of belonging. And that's something that he's never had. So it's volunteers like that just, um, it's overwhelming to hear the stories on how the King's Table and a place of comfort and them giving back has, has set the pace. Well, my testimony is, is that I, uh, my wife went into the hospital. Uh, and uh, at that time, it was very serious. Uh, she uh, was grooming for a heart transplant. And she had a procedure that didn't, uh, her best interests. Uh, quality of life it was what she wouldn't want it to be and I remember it was in May at that time and I was just going through so much uh, with the pandemic and everything and it was my cousin and I just called her to give an update of her for her cousin and she said Andre get into that Bible because you are struggling she didn't say you might want to read or you know I'll pray for you she told me to get in it and I got in it and God just opened up the doors and introduced me to the King's Table. And that was back in May of 2020. And I think it was at its beginning stages. And it just opened up my spirit because it took my mind off of what I was going through, 
but to realize there was so many people going through so much and just the humility behind it just to serve them and just people living out their cars it just took my mind over everything and the personnel all of us together as one big family it was just awesome and they just covered me and it just helped me up to this point that i'm still serving <laughs> Hello, this is Cheryl. I'm Cheryl Hayes. I've been in New Birth since 1992. I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 1996. Um, um, that slowed me down. I couldn't work anymore. However, I kept coming coming to church and serving with the usher ministry. Um, as the King's Table was initiated, I worked with Miss Flossie and Miss Jerry, um, which was the vision of um, Minister Long. We started organizing all the food and serving the people that were in need was the part that really brought joy to me. I served with them Tuesday through Sunday. I'm here at the church. Um, it brings joy to me because I like reaching out. I like serving the people. I'm doing God's work and I'm doing what's needed for the community and for our society. And it's really good. It's really good. Um, as I said, I suffer, I suffer from MS. I have good days and bad days. But even through the pain I have, through anxiety I have, I know that I can still serve other people. That's what Jesus wants us to do, serve other people. And I can, I'm still upright, meaning I can walk. So many people with MS are in wheelchairs. I've been blessed not to be in the wheelchair. I walk with a cane sometimes, but I still get around. I force myself to get around. I force myself to, through challenges to make sure I'm here to serve the people, serve the community, and provide food who, need, who needs it. I also have uh, Joe, for instance, is another wonderful volunteer. Yes, yeah, so again, my name is Joseph Crocker Jr. and I've been involved with the King's Table since it started in February of 2020 under the great leadership of Ms. Flossie, Ms. Jerry, and of course, Pastor Carlos Stokes. And then the baton was passed to my King's Table wife, Miss Carrie. Joe has been a part of New Birth for 26, 27 years. And I remember him sharing his story, how he came to the ministry. He said a friend invited him and he sat in the back one night at Bible study and the pastor, Bishop Long was preaching at that time. And he kept saying, watch this, watch this, watch this. He, Joe said, I got scared. I was like, what does this man want me to watch? I kept looking around and I didn't see anything, but he just kept saying, watch this, watch this. And he said at that time, many convictions fell upon him and some things that he was doing. And he just, he said, I knew I had to get right. 
And so that wasn't, he didn't stop at the first encounter. He continuously came back and later became a member. So Joe has been with the ministry a long time. And let me say this, she does a phenomenal job of running the King's Table. What she really, King's table? oh Lord, that's a good one. Everything, set up, breaking down boxes, um, sometimes putting food in the boxes. But for the most part, we, me, Melvin and I, we prepare things for Saturday, like the unloading of trucks and deliveries and whatever this need to be done, I'm here for it. And I get a great joy out of doing it. And as long as God give me the strength, I will keep doing it. And let me say this about my coworkers, Miss Cheryl, Miss Sherry. Her, she and I started at the same time in February of 2020, and she's still here. She's getting ready to go, but we got a great team of people that does this, and I think we do a great job. It's just the, the dedication that he gives to the King's Table is unbelievable. And another volunteer, Cheryl, Cheryl has been with us for some years as well, since 92, I believe. But Cheryl is a great spirited person. She gives her all in everything that she does, despite her handicaps. You know, she shared with us that uh, she was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and she has her good days and bad days. But can I tell you, Cheryl has not missed one day, not one day since January 29th of 2020 of that ribbon cutting, serving here at the King's Table. She has been here faithfully every single week and she said carrie i pushed my way through because i i tell myself if i don't go who's going to put the food boxes together who's going to help feed the people so it's volunteers like that that i have such a great appreciation for their consistency all of our volunteers um compared to food uh you know there's a terminology called tempering um most people think of tempering in a bad way, but tempering in the food world, I connect the two. I, I consider my volunteers the tempering portion um, of the King's Table. Because in tempering with cooking, all you do is put a, a couple of additives in it, but it doesn't change the characteristic of the whole pot. It does not change. So the volunteers are the little, tempering additives to the whole ministry and we cannot do what we do without them they bring a little bit of spice they bring a little bit of salt they bring a little bit of everything to make the whole pot what it is so i just love our volunteers What you just witnessed is not a story, it's a testimony. The road to one million. I almost stammer in my speech to say to you uh, what it sounds uh, almost heretical. Can you imagine that we have fed more than Jesus? He had two fish, five loaves of bread and was able to feed 5,000, not including women and children. And then he passed a note to new birth. And here's what it said. Greater things than these will you be able to do. We've lived up to that prophecy and we now stand on his word at one million. I'm grateful unto God that unlike the disciples, we believe that it was going to happen. And we had the privilege of serving with baskets left over. What a relief it would be if I could make the declaration that there's no more food insecurity, but that's not so. There are still those who wake up every day unsure how it is that they're going to provide sustenance for their children and give nourishment to their seniors. Yea, but for the grace of God, there go I and there goes you. I want you to do me a favor, please. I want you to fall in the shadow of that nameless and faceless boy who came and gave a offering, two fish, five loaves of bread, 
and said, I'm not one of the disciples. I'm not one of the Pharisees, not one of the Sadducees, but I want to give something to be able to be a part of this miracle. After you've bore witness to what God did in the middle of a pandemic, I want you now to know you have another opportunity to participate in what God is doing in this hour. I don't want fish. I don't want bread. I want seeds. I don't care how it is that you are moved. I ideally would want you to give a million for the one million that have already been served. But as close to it as you can is what I want you to surrender. So if you can't do a million, a thousand, one hundred, five hundred, five thousand, two thousand. Or if you don't have two fish, five loaves of bread, two hundred and fifty dollars. Little becomes much when we place it in the master's hand. If we were able to do this in the middle of a global crisis, what can we do now that the Negro spiritual is coming to pass, that the storm is passing over? We're taking a bite out of hunger and I need to use your teeth. I need your seed. Would you sow right now all of the options that are available for you to do it are below me in this moment. I need you to know we're not just making a history. We are making a documentary and I want you to be a part of it. God bless you and thank you on behalf of the one million who couldn't sit in this chair.